Praise the Lord, everybody. It is so wonderful to once again be here with you on stream at the Pentecostal Church. It is my honor and privilege to be your assistant pastor, and I am glad to be standing in the stead of our pastor this evening. I am sure he is on the stream, as are many of you, I would hope. I do want to start tonight with a number of very important announcements. Not a big number, but a number. You'll discover how big that number is in a moment. First big primary announcement is our prayer room dedication is happening right now. We are in the middle of dedicating our prayer room and participating in the National Day of Prayer and a three-day prayer and fast chain. So we're kind of hitting everything all at once here. We're scattering on it. Um, what that means is if you have not already picked a prayer time, I'm going to take a look down here. Looks like we're pretty booked up, but there is 3 p.m. on Thursday still open and 11 p.m. on Thursday still open. So if you have not signed up yet for a prayer time or if you look at the list in the TPC private group and you see that somebody is already there, but that's the only time you can pray, that's fine. Come and pray. We want you to be a part of our prayer room dedication. I know that Pastor uh, will be preaching a phenomenal sermon on Sunday about our prayer room. And we're not going to want to miss that. Uh, but in the meantime, let's do the work. Let's put the prayer in. Let's put the fasting in. Put, put the plate aside. If it's not the plate, then put the computer aside or the cell phone or whatever. Um, gentlemen, don't put your phone aside and then say, oh, sorry, wife, you can't call or text me because I'm fasting my phone. It doesn't work that way. Be sensible, but fast. Uh, and pray. So that covers our prayer room dedication. Um, also, if you have not already in the private group looked at pastor's announcement, I am encouraging you to not write this second, but at the end of the stream tonight, go and look at pastor's announcement. This is very important. It is regarding the future of our church family and our membership here, um, how we're going to be handling things going forward. So you need to view this post. It's very important. If you are not a member of that private group, you're not a member of our church, we love you anyway. Uh, this is just for family, so don't worry about that. Now, I am glad to be here this evening. There, there was a very tiny chance that instead of being here, I could have been uh, recovering from smoke inhalation or fire damage. Um, shortly before service started, while I was feverishly reviewing my notes and preparing for this evening, uh, Isaac came into my office at home and said, Dad, I'm hungry. And I was like, okay, well, let's feed you quickly because Daddy's busy. And uh, I fixed him some mac and cheese in the microwave and handed it to him, went back to work. Well, he uh, came in about 10, 15 minutes later and walks into my office and taps me on the shoulder and goes, Dad, did you take the lid off the mac and cheese when you put it in the microwave? I was like, yes, of course I did. I handed it to you with the fork in it. You ate it. Of course, there was no lid on it. And he goes, well, are you sure you did that? And I'm trying to focus on a seven-year-old and God at the same time. And, you know, I, I've tried to make this transition at the end of the workday where, all right, it's Wednesday night or it's Sunday. It's time to focus on what's happening. And, and he's interrupting that. So I'm flustered and I'm going, what is wrong with you? And he goes, no, because I smell smoke, Dad. And uh, for those of you that have known me for any length of time, you know I have almost no sense of smell, which for the most part you can survive just fine with, um, but there are certain scenarios in which that presents a danger to yourself and others. And so as soon as he said, I smell smoke, while I was frustrated, I stood up and followed him into the kitchen where I walked face first into half of the house engulfed in smoke. And uh, suddenly my mind snapped into instant clarity. And I asked him, already knowing what the answer was going to be, did you try and make more mac and cheese? The answer to the melted puddle of plastic and burn marks in the microwave was yes. <laughs> So I threw all the windows open and turned on the fans and scraped the goo out of the microwave 
The char marks are still in there. We're going to have to deal with that later. And thanked the Lord that the fire was contained to the microwave. And it was just a small portion of it. So it'll clean. It'll be fine. Uh, But I'm glad to be here with all of you. And I'm sure Isaac is. (laughs) Glad to not be here, but be at home in an unburned house. So, we've been talking since last week about the gifts of the Spirit. Now, I realized after watching myself on stream afterward, because that's what I do, I treat these streams as like post-game footage, and I go off by myself and put in my headphones and review how well I did or did not teach, and things I could have done better, or pat myself on the back for how amazing I was. And (laughs) I realized after watching the footage last week that I may have gotten a little too deep into the weeds without spending any time really talking about what the gifts of the Spirit are in general. So before I go on to finish our deep dive lesson of the nine gifts of the Spirit, of which we still have three to cover, I'm going to talk a little bit more generally about the gifts of the Spirit as a whole. And I'm going to start with our text from last week, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse number 1. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse number 1. If you have your Bible, look it up. If you're staring at the teeny tiny picture-in-picture on the stream that has the Scripture on there, Lord bless your vision. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse number 1, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. I want to jump down to verse number 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given the Spirit of the word of wisdom, by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit. To another faith, by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing, by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another diverse kinds of tongues to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these things worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Before we continue, I wonder if we could put our Bibles to the side, our close our Bible apps, and lift our hands this evening and ask the Lord to speak to us as we dig into His Word. Father, I am so thankful to once again be able to come into Your house and join with Your people, even if it is only on the Internet. I ask tonight that you would move upon our hearts and our minds, that you would speak into the very core of our being and help us to absorb and receive your word as it is delivered. I pray that these gifts of the Spirit would touch us, that we would begin to desire them as individuals, to find some that resonate with us, Lord, and take the knowledge that we gain this evening and seek more your gifts and your Spirit. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, 1 Corinthians speaks of gifts as miraculous abilities that operate by the power of the Holy Ghost. Let's look for a moment at the character of these supernatural spiritual gifts. Now, the first thing we have to understand is that the Holy Ghost is the origin of all of the gifts. They come from the Spirit of God Himself, with a particular reference to His spiritual essence and action. Looking together in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters." Looking also into John chapter 4 and verse 24, 
John chapter 4 and verse 24. It says, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. When we look at these scriptures in context, we see that the spirit is God at work in our lives. When God moves upon us, when He speaks into us, this is His spirit at work. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 7 make it clear that God is the source of the gifts of the Spirit. And while these gifts may differ and have different functions, and even the manner in which they're used could vary, the one true God is the author of all of them. He's the one that gives them to us. And He's the one, when they're being used, that's actually doing the work. Now, simply stated, these gifts are supernatural. They're not something that we have on our own. They're not something that we are innately born with. They're not something that uh, we can learn on the internet. You can't YouTube uh, how to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Now, you could probably look that up in YouTube, but it's not really going to help you. Our passage in 1 Corinthians describes these gifts as works of God and as manifestations of the Spirit. A manifestation is a demonstration or a display. It's something that is revealed or shown very plainly. It's a mistake to try and define these gifts in terms of natural human abilities like so many do. People try and define things like the word of wisdom as having good judgment and counseling ability or the gifts of healing as the ability to be a good doctor or a nurse. They might even say that the gift of tongues is the ability to learn foreign languages, but these are carnal definitions. These are things that human beings can do without any supernatural intervention. God doesn't have to be involved for us to learn a foreign language. Well, maybe for somebody He does, but for most of us He doesn't. He doesn't have to get in the middle of us being good or bad doctors. That is simply uh, whether or not you are studying hard enough and talented in that particular arena. If we were to take these definitions, uh, someone who has never felt God's presence or even been filled with His Spirit could exercise every single gift of the Spirit just as good as any lifelong believer. Maybe even better if they search YouTube real hard. Now, of course, in a general sense, all talents, abilities, and gifts come from God. He gives us everything. He is the source of what we're good at. If you're a good artist, hey, God gave you that ability. You also had to work really hard at it. God gave you the natural inclination, and then you had to work at it. Um, I used to draw. I don't anymore, and I tried the other day, and it was a lot harder than I remember. Some talents and abilities take practice. Now, God creates us as spiritual, moral, and intellectual beings. We're created in His image. And we have qualities that come with those features. Our text doesn't merely talk generally of gifts that flow from the grace of God, but instead, 1 Corinthians 12 focuses on the supernatural aspect by describing these gifts as spiritual <clears throat> They're not things that are easily produced by man. They're not something that you can imitate and get away with very easily. Look with me in the book of Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. This text is highlighting the supernatural character of the gifts of the Spirit. It states, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at first began to be spoken by the Lord? It comes from God. It's gifted by Him. It's bestowed upon us by His will and at His pleasure. The gift of tongues is a good example of this. 1 Corinthians 14, 
reveals to us that it isn't a gift of learning languages, but a gift of speaking miraculously in languages that you have never learned and that the hearer and audience may not even understand. Understanding that these are supernatural gifts in origin, it's important to be able to ID these gifts accurately as well as use them properly. Let me give you an example. A charismatic group advertised once that it was conducting a school on prophecy. There, is, there are very few things that get my dander up, like somebody talking about how they're going to teach you how to be spiritual. Now, your pastor can teach you how to live right. He can show you where to find things in the Word of God, but your pastor can't teach you how to speak in tongues. And the man of God shouldn't be teaching you, today you're going to learn the gift of prophecy. That's, that's not right. Now, the school promised to teach every student how to prophesy and additionally promised that every student would receive a personal prophecy before the end of the seminar. Those are some guarantees. Those are some awfully big checks to be writing. Now, if the gifts operate according to God's administration, how could anyone guarantee Who's going to get which gifts and how they're going to use them? There's a lot of value in learning about the gifts of the Spirit and digging deep into each one of them, its characteristics, its operation, the signs that follow it and reveal that it's actually a gift, and even learning how to surrender to God's Spirit so that you can be prepared for Him to use you in that way. But it's foolish to suggest that anybody can grant one of these gifts to somebody else or even exercise that gift necessarily on demand. I can't lay hands on you and say, you now have the gift of prophecy. It's not my gift to give. I can't call you up one morning and say, I have decided that we need more working of miracles in our church, and you, Bubba, you're the one. Start working some miracles. It doesn't work that way. They're not my gifts to give. You see, we can't teach anybody how to prophesy or work miracles. What we can do is teach people how to be available for the Spirit of God to work through them. We can teach them how to recognize when God is moving through them and speaking into them and wants them to operate in a specific way. We can help them to recognize the voice of the Lord as He speaks His will into you. That we can do. But at the end of the day, it is He who enables those gifts to whosoever He will. We can see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And verse 11. 1 Corinthians 12 and 11. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. That's the key right there at the end. As he will. Now, last week I encouraged us to desire the gifts of the Spirit, to reach out for them, to pray for them, to, to covet them, to want to have them in your life, and that hasn't changed. But the gifts that you operate in are still subject to His will. He's the one who gives it. He's the one who says it's time to use it as He will. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 4 echoes very much the same. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 4. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. We can pray with people. We can promise them that God will hear and respond. We can pray for God's direction and then share with somebody whatever it is that God tells us. In doing so, however, we've got to be careful to keep the focus on God and on His will. Now, this is important 
The gifts of the Spirit are a wonderful thing, and, and I, I talked about this a little bit last week, but I'm going to talk about it again because it is valuable to you. Some people can get wrapped up in the gifts that God has given them, and they start to get a little bit weird. They get a little bit nutty. They start to spiritualize everything. I woke up this morning, and I had a flat tever, t- flat tire. I told that devil, no! You can't have my tire. They looked down into their Captain Crunch for breakfast, and all of the crunch berries are blue. And in those crunch berries, they see a vision of the Holy Ghost descending down upon them as blue orbs of light in their cereal bowl. They get a little bit out there. When people start trying to use the gifts of the Spirit on demand without any preparation that needs to be done in the Spirit first, or without recognizing that God has given that gift for use for His purpose and His glory, things start to get a little messed up. Now, I've known different men and women throughout the years who have fallen victim to this. God used them mightily. They could come in and they could prophesy. Man, they would open their mouth and it was like God revealed to them all truths in the universe. They would be used mightily in laying on of hands and they would lay hands on the, on the sick and they'd be healed and, and they'd lay hands on people with anxiety and they would go away and, and they were powerful in the Holy Ghost. I've known them. Or God will use them and, and at some point it starts to go from being about God and it, it becomes about me. And it's about my glory and, and my exaltation and they're my gifts and they're my callings, not the gifts and callings of God. These individuals start trying to use God, God's gifts for their own ends. They strive and hope to be able to recreate these great moments in God over and over and over again without Him actually being in the middle of it. Can I tell you something? They're miracles because they don't happen every day. They're supernatural because we can't compel them on demand. When we get to a place where we are trying over and over again to recreate something that God has done, we have already failed because we couldn't create it in the first place. It's God who does it. It's His power and His authority and His will. And anything outside of that is theater. Inevitably, these men and women will fail. Their prophecies no longer have meaning. They don't prophesy correctly anymore. They make wild presumptions that never come to pass. They pray things over you that make no sense whatsoever and are diametrically opposed to what God has been dealing with you about. They corrupt the gifts they've been given, and in the end, they lose. Don't get me wrong, desiring the gifts is a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's something we ought to desire and pray for. But we have got to be so careful about what our motives are. Why do we want to be used in those gifts? Why do we want to see them in operation? I want to see them in operation all the time. I want to come to church and it be totally normal for somebody to be slain in the spirit and the dead person in the back to be raised and somebody in a wheelchair over here to start dancing. I would love to see it all the time. And while it shouldn't be unusual, it will never be normal. That's what makes it special. We are channels of God's Spirit, and He expects us to exercise His gifts according to His Word, not our own agendas. We have to regulate ourselves or we'll misuse what He's given us. Did you know that even 
in living for God, moderation is important? You can pray too much. You can fast yourself to death. You can do anything too much. And there are times in our lives where God will move on us and He will draw us into moments of deep prayer and fasting and meditation. He will take us through seasons where all we want to do is pray and and go deeper into the things of God. And that's okay, but at some point you have to come out and live again because those heavenly places weren't intended for mortals to dwell. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 32 says this, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. What does that mean? That means you have a choice and you have some control. It may not be the right time for you to jump up and start screaming things in the middle of church. When pastor is reaching for a lost soul over here, it may not be the right time for you to run over and throw somebody to the ground and lay hands on their head and cast out a devil you think is there. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. I mentioned last week that God is very into order. Every, look at the universe and tell me that God is not a God of order. If even one little thing goes wrong, everything starts to spiral apart. If the earth was tilted just a little bit one direction, you would destroy what we know as our ecosystem. If we got just a little bit closer to the sun, we'd burn up. If we got just too, a little bit too far, we'd all freeze. Everything is a delicate balance in God's creation. Our will plays an important part in the exercise of spiritual gifts, mostly as breaks. Because sometimes our humanity gets in the way of what God's trying to do, and we've got to put a stop on that. We always have to remember that God's gifts originate in the mind and power of God. The most important thing to consider when using the gifts of the Spirit isn't our will, but God's. If you lay hands on the sick and they don't immediately recover, it had nothing to do with you. You could have had all the faith in the world that you could say unto this mountain, be ye removed, and it would go. But that doesn't matter if it's not God's will. We have to be careful to be cognizant of it, to seek after it. When we pray for someone, we must pray according to God's will. We see this a lot in our lives as we live for God. When somebody is sick, like I mentioned, it may be God's will to pray for that person, but the Bible also lets us know that they don't always recover, and not necessarily right away. James chapter 5 and 14 instructs us to pray for the sick. It says, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And yet we all know somebody who has died of cancer. In the middle of this pandemic, there are great men of God who have passed away because of the result of the disease. What this gift doesn't guarantee is a healing in the way and time a person wants. Unless we hear specifically from God saying otherwise, we shouldn't assume that when we operate in the gifts, they're going to go the way we want them to. What we can do is promise people that God will hear our prayer and God will act. Have you ever heard it said that God always answer prayer? The answer just isn't always yes. Now, I've personally found that God has three answers for me. Yes, no, and silence. Yes is pretty clear. No is pretty clear. Silence is more like, try again later. Or, pray a little bit longer. We're supposed to pray and believe God for a healing. 
but we can't dictate how and when God will actually work. Sometimes God answers with an instantaneous miracle, and those are the ones we remember forever. But there are also times when he doesn't. Either way, God is at work. If he doesn't deliver a person immediately from their trial, he will give them grace to make it through. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above all that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. A lot, of that, a lot of us have heard this as, God will not put more on you than you can bear. And it doesn't specifically say that here. It says, he'll make a way to escape so that you can bear. I mean, sometimes we go through things and we have to go all the way through them. Sometimes we go through things and he makes a way for us to kind of end run around some of the effects. But at the end, we still have to live through that moment. I know in my own life and in the situation that I went through a few years ago and the sickness that I dealt with, the Lord was with me the whole time. He kept me. He protected me. He restored me often, but I still had to go through it because he was trying to make something more out of me. He was trying to teach me a greater lesson. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, read, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that he might depart, or that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Even the great apostle Paul, the guy that most of us look to as like Christian number one, the guy who had it all together, even he went through things. Even he, like us, asked God to take hardships and things that he was suffering through away in both of these scriptures, God responds positively to prayer. Even if he says no to your specific request, he will give you the grace and the strength to do his will in the middle of those circumstances. To sum all of that up, we shouldn't focus on our performance of a notable deed. When we're operating in the gifts of the Spirit, we shouldn't be like, bam, that's how it's going to happen. Oh, no. It didn't. We shouldn't get lost in that because God's going to do what he's going to do. We're just a vessel for it. We're just a conduit for it. We should focus on being that vessel and that channel for God to do whatever he wants to through us. I got to tell you from personal experience, when he does, it's amazing. Some of the best feeling moments of my life were the Holy Ghost moving through me. Memories that I will never lose. But it was God operating as he wanted at the time, not, not how I told him he was going to operate. I often pray that God will do his will in my life, taking me where he wants me to go and doing with me whatever he sees fit. That's, that's the right way. We can ask what we want. We can pray for the things that we need. But at the end of the day, we need to be willing to submit to the will of God. Now, since the spiritual gifts come from God, we should draw attention to what God is doing, not what people are doing. It troubles me when the primary emphasis of the gifts of the Spirit being in operation are so-and-so ministries. This is what we recognize it is. Bishop, elder, reverend, superstar so-and-so with so-and-so ministries is going to come into your town and revolutionize your church with his mighty acts in the Holy Ghost. Footnote, as God wills, TM. 
or when we put all of the emphasis on particular types of gifts. It's also worrisome to me when people promote a gift like healing, prophecy, or word of knowledge as the only thing that matters in what's coming out of this service. Now, we are going to have moments where the gifts of the Spirit are going to happen. And because we're praying for them and we want them, we're going to rejoice when they happen. And there may be times when the pastor says, I feel this in the house right now. This is going to happen. And it will. Because if pastor feels that it's God. But he's not going to, he's not going to have me print up a flyer that says, this Sunday, sister so-and-so is going to be healed. I am going to do mighty works in the name of Jesus, myself. That's not how it's going to be. It bothers me when it happens that way. It troubles me when I see these things, and it should trouble you too, because that's not how God operates. The gifts of the Spirit aren't designed to exalt a preacher's reputation instead of promoting the divine purpose behind them. For instance, the gifts of healing are often a very effective method of building faith and even sparking revival that leads people to salvation. We can see examples of this all over Scripture, but I'm going to read a nice long one for you in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Acts chapter 3, 1 through 11. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom, that, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he that sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at all that had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was heal, healed held Peter and John, my brain just stopped there. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. Now I like how this happens here. It unfolds in this passage of Scripture. He stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. You notice who he's giving all the glory to there? You notice who's getting all the credit for the miracle? Peter and John aren't standing there going, Oh, let me hit you with my jacket. I healed you. It's all about God. It's all about Him. Acts chapter 4 and verse 4 says, How many, how be it, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. People were greatly moved in situations like this, and the effect is clearly noted. If a meeting or ministry focuses on healing while neglecting the message of salvation, then God's purpose in granting healing is not fully accomplished. God likes to show miraculous things to reach people. He does the miraculous. He heals the sick and He raises the dead to get people's attention and bring them to an altar of repentance. Now God grants the spiritual gifts of 1 Corinthians 12 for times of special need or crisis. In the church, the supernatural gifts should be not unusual, but also not boring because they happen all the time. They should be expected, yet not unexpected, if that makes any sense. They don't operate continually, 
but they should happen. If they were here all the time, every day, we wouldn't think of them as supernatural. They would just be boring. For example, in the Gospels and Acts, multitudes of people were healed, and several people were raised from the dead. Even so, everybody in the church eventually died without being raised again. We can assume that many of them probably died of illnesses or diseases that also weren't healed. The gifts of healing and working of miracles were common, but they don't always happen. Jesus undoubtedly passed that lame man at the temple gate over and over again, but he didn't heal him on those occasions. Instead, the man was healed when he encountered Peter and John in Acts 3. While God brought Dorcas back from the dead in Acts 9, he didn't raise up the apostle James when he was executed in Acts 12. We need to not only be used in these wonderful and supernatural gifts, but we also need to understand them. We need to appreciate them for what they are and give credit and glory unto the God who grants them. Not, he doesn't do it because of who we are. He doesn't do it because we pray just the right amount. There are people with amazing prayer lives who will never raise the dead. He does it because he wants to when he wants to. And it's our duty as people that are seeking after the gifts of the Spirit to allow him to choose us and even ask him to do so. And with all of that being said, I want to finish where we left off last week with the remainder of the hour. And if you remember, we broke our gifts of the Spirit, our nine gifts, into three categories. The third and final being the action gifts, power gifts. Those three are these, faith, gifts of healing, and the working of miracles. These gifts demonstrate the power of God. They give credence to his reality and his presence. These are the gifts we think about the most. These are the ones that we want and that we should want. These three are powerful. They're life-changing. They're the kind of things that can turn an entire city upside down. The first of those is the gift of faith. Now, there is faith, and then there's the gift of faith. The gift of faith is a supernatural kind. It is purely extra. It is not that I was born with this tiny measure of faith kind of faith. It exhibits itself when circumstances are just right. Things like tragedy, danger, severe illness, accidents, and other situations that seem completely out of our control. Now, all of us, to some extent, I believe, know, or at least think we know, that God can do anything. And that when extreme things happen, we can call on His name. Now, there is a demand for faith that goes beyond God can to God will. It's that gift of faith. It's no longer just, this is a nebulous thing that might happen. It is a, this is happening now, faith. Faith moves God. It touches Him. He will move the heavens and the earth when he encounters faith. In fact, he broke the dispensational barriers between the law and grace when he encountered the Canaanite woman just because of her faith. He wasn't there for Gentiles. At that point, Gentiles couldn't even be saved. But he crossed lines. He, he traversed time because of her faith. In Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28, I'm going to read the NIV version. It says, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. 
my daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed in that moment. This woman's faith was supernatural. It was beyond normal. She had a need that was so great, and she recognized that Jesus was the only one who could do it. He was the only source. He was the only authority and power that had the ability to save and heal her daughter. And when she took that faith to God, it moved him so powerfully. There was nothing happening for the Gentiles then. Jesus was there ministering to the Jews. And yet this Canaanite woman broke all the rules, tore down all the walls, and traversed every barrier, and her faith reached God. The gift of faith. It's so much more than that base amount that all of us have. It's a special portion of faith that is granted by the Holy Ghost. It comes to the rescue when ordinary faith just won't do. It's miraculous and instantaneous. It's a touch of faith that goes beyond all reason and possibility. And in its very existence, at the core of its essence, it demands a miracle. Let's say you're on a ship and a storm comes in. And all the other ships in the area are being destroyed by the wind and the raging waves. In that moment, the gift of faith comes on you. And with certainty and conviction, you declare, we will be safe. And no damage will be done. And you survive. That's the gift of faith. Now, if... In addition to that, you command the wind and you say, stop, and the wind cease and become quiet. That's a miracle. To go through fire like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would be the gift of faith in action. But putting out the fire at a word is a working of a miracle. To go through the storm safely would be the gift of faith. To stop the storm would be the working of a miracle. Faith is like energy. It intensifies within us. It can be stored. It can be harnessed. It can be used to power things. It's intensified when the gift of faith is in action. When that happens, we've got to act on it. When that, when that battery is full, when that faith reaches max capacity, we have got to unleash it. We have got to let it out on the world. We have got to tap into it and use it. Action and obedience, when we take that, when we say, in the name of Jesus, you will be healed, and we lay hands on somebody, that kind of action and obedience pleases God. He's touched by our faith and motivated to act on our behalf. The next in this group is the gifts of healing. For this one, I want to take a moment to highlight an important understanding here. It is the gifts of healing. Notice the plurality. Notice that little extra S, the gifts of healing. The Bible doesn't make it a singular gift, but a multiple of them. When the gifts of healing are in operation and hands get laid on the sick, God can remove the cause of a disease 
and bring a healing. Often, what causes that not to happen is because we let the devil defeat us by convincing us that what we're doing doesn't really work. We let our faith get weakened in that moment, and it halts the miracle. For example, if I go out into my yard, and I have a particularly obnoxious tree, and I decide, you know what? I can run a chainsaw. I can put this tree down. I've watched Lumberjacks in the movies. I got this. And you cut that tree down and manage not to destroy your house or lose any limbs. As that tree lays on the ground, a neighbor comes by and says, Hey, that tree is alive. And you've got to look at him and go, I just cut it down. You see the big chainsaw right there? You see all the sawdust? You see how I barely missed my wife's car? That tree is dead. The neighbor might even argue with you and say, no, that tree is alive because the leaves are green. He could argue about it for days. But eventually, the truth of that tree being dead comes out. It's been cut off from the roots. The leaves are going to brown and fall away and be blown off by the wind. And then maybe, depending on how contentious your neighbor is, he'll admit, okay, that tree is dead. This happens to us sometimes with healing. We pray for it. We believe it. We know that God is able to do it. But because the symptoms are still there, because the healing isn't immediate, we start to convince ourselves that the healing didn't happen. We retroactively go back and start deleting faith from that miracle. Because I prayed in faith and the Holy Ghost moved through me and I laid hands on somebody with cancer and they did not immediately have a tumor fall off of their neck, they're not healed. That's not true. Now the devil might try and convince you that's true because there's no tumors laying on the ground. But it's not true. We need to hold tight to our original faith. The faith that was used in that prayer faith that was done in the name of Jesus and recognize that some healings aren't immediate. They take time. They take patience. Something so many of us lack sometimes. My son, for example, not having the patience to ask his dad to make more mac and cheese. Some people have made it to a point to continuously thank God for their miracle, and that works much better. If you can get yourself to a place where it didn't happen right away, but you can start thanking God for it anyway, you are more likely to see that happen than not. Now, within the Gospels, there is a statement, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. It can be found in Luke chapter 5 and verse 17. It is incredible to me that the power of the Lord is there to heal all the time. God's power isn't, isn't changing. It's not dependent on anything. God is not less powerful today than He was yesterday. He is not more powerful today than He was yesterday. And He won't be any more powerful tomorrow than He is right now. His power is constant. His healing power is ever-present. The question is, can we get to it? Can we tap into it? Is it the right time? Is it His will? Are we operating in the gifts of the Spirit? Have we fasted and prayed and, and put ourselves in a position where He can do what He wants to do? Healing is one of the signs which follows believers. It's ministry that is able to pray for us, and even non-ministry, we can lay hands on the sick and they recover. These promises and signs are supposed to be not common, but not unusual. That's been said <clears throat> that there are 39 major deadly diseases in the world. I've heard this before. In the past, we've made the extra step of linking the 39 stripes placed on the Lord's back through Isaiah 53 and 5, which states, and with his stripes we are healed. 
Uh, God knows what he's doing, and he does all things well. So that may be accurate. I don't know. I'm going to have to ask God, Lord, are the 39 stripes 39 diseases? Because I've also preached a sermon where by his stripes we are healed does not necessarily indicate a physical healing. We can break disease into two sources. Demonic spirits. Look at how many times in Jesus' ministry spirits were cast out and healing ensued. Now, where we've got to be careful is making everything a demon. Not everything is a devil. I'm going to tell you right now that depression, there may be a devil that causes depression, but there is also a biological condition that causes it too. And we have got to deal with it. I'm not going to be able to just walk up to you and say, mm, that devil of depression is gone. You're not praying enough. That's not accurate. That's not true. Because the other kind of disease is organic. There are spirits of infirmity. There are spirits that bring disease, but there are also viruses and ailments of the body that just happen. Aging is the worst disease of all. 100% death rate. Yep. COVID-19, 1% death rate. Age, 100%. You will die if you live long enough. <laughs> Either of these kind, whether they're organic or spiritual, are well within the power of God to take care of in accordance with His will and in His time. And we can be used in the gifts of healing to be a part of that. The third and final of the gifts I want to talk about tonight is the working of miracles. And this one is the exciting one. This is the one where things, they happen right now. To be prayed for and slowly recover is one thing. But to be prayed for and instantly healed, that is another thing entirely. The slow recovery is the gifts of healing and operation, but the instant healing is the working of miracles. A good example of this is Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, where the lame man hears the words, such as I have, give I thee. We talked about that a moment ago. Immediately he leaps to his feet and runs into the temple. Interestingly enough, this was such a notable miracle, such a powerful miracle moment that it's referenced again in Acts chapter 4 and 16, and yet again in verse 22, which calls the healing a miracle. The working of miracles is a gift of the Spirit in which the power of God is released through a person's life to cause something supernatural to happen right now. Throughout the Bible, there are many miracles performed by believers, things like the parting of the Red Sea, I can't remember the last time I hit a rock with a rod and water came out. Unless it was a water balloon and not a rock. And then why was I hitting it with a rod? Not because I was trying to do anything for God. I'm stuck in a rhyme loop. Hang on, give me one second. Things like the parting of the Red Sea, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus walking on water, raising the dead. You ever think about that one miracle where they throw the dead guy on the bones of the prophet and he comes back to life again? That's a miracle. If you're throwing my dead body on another dead guy's bones, I want to know why I couldn't afford a grave. I am not expecting to leap up after touching another dead guy's bones. I remember once being at a youth function with a young man, and they were playing sports ball. If you look at me, you can tell I'm not a big sports ball guy. Um, I have found other ways to occupy my time. Nothing wrong with sports ball, okay? Except I do find it hilarious that they're having to pipe in sounds to all the empty stadiums now. And I'm like, man, that's called headphones. I've been playing video games for years. <laughs> um, anyway, I remember once at a youth function, they were playing outside. We were playing soccer or something, and somebody went down. And they went down hard. 
And they brought him up to the parking lot and set him on the bed of a truck. And, and we were looking at him, and, and somebody's going, oh, man, that ankle's broken. That thing, it, that is pointed the wrong direction. That does not look right. And the poor guy that they picked up off the ground is screaming in pain. I remember gathering around with those young people and the leaders that were with us and laying hands on that man, that young man, and praying in faith. I, I remember like it was yesterday, when I put my hand on him, I started picturing in my mind bones moving back together with all the faith that I could muster with all the people that were around with us and praying, Lord, heal this young man. When we were done, that foot looked just fine. In fact, he got up and ran off and played some more sports ball. There are miracles in our day. I will never forget in this sanctuary right here when I saw people pick up a woman and put her on a table and the preacher come down and you could see her legs were off. They were like this. One leg was up here and one leg was down here. And she was laid flat. And as the man of God prayed for her, that other leg started to grow. And not like some slow, a lizard grew his tail back one time over the course of years kind of thing, but freaked me out. But I saw it. I'll never forget it. Or the time in the corner over here where a young lady came who had been wheelchair bound for a huge chunk of her life. And as the man of God went and prayed for her, she got up out of that wheelchair and that girl walked. It may not have been any more than five or six feet, but she hadn't walked in years. That's a miracle. The working of miracles through the gifts of the Spirit are as needed today as they have ever been. We need miracles. Not only do they affirm our faith, not only do they help other people and lift them up, but they are proof beyond a shadow of a doubt that the power of God is real. They are the irrefutable evidence that only God could do this. Cancer, gone. Death, cured. Only God can do those things. One of the great things about them is that they don't generally work independently of one another either. You don't just get a service where it's one gift wonder. Today in this service, there will only be prophecy. No, when the gifts of the Spirit start to move, they start to swirl all around. You might have tongues and interpretation. You might have a healing happen over here. You might have a miracle happen over there. You might have somebody who has just been praying for their entire life that they would be able to interpret something and then prophesy in the Holy Ghost. It could happen at any moment in pockets all around the church. The gifts of the Spirit work together and often many at once. As a quick example, there are multiple instances in the Bible of people being raised from the dead. When somebody is raised from the dead, it's easy to look back at what we've learned tonight and see how the gift of faith could be working. Also, how the gift of healing was there and the working of miracles. They overlap and work together to bring the desired result. The gifts of healing and the gift of faith often work hand in hand as well, just like diverse kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. These are such wonderful gifts, all nine of them. I would that we could see them in operation in the church as often as possible. Can you name them? All of them, be honest. If you can't, that's okay. Go back to 1 Corinthians. Read it over and over and over again. Memorize the gifts of the Spirit. Begin to take them to the Lord in prayer. We're praying and fasting for three days. There is nothing that says you can't walk into that prayer room and say, Lord, I would love the gift of prophecy. Use me in the gift of prophecy on Sunday. No reason why you couldn't do that. I wonder if we could end this evening asking the Lord to use us 
in the gifts of the Spirit. If it's going to be anybody, if God can use donkeys and roosters and all manner of things, why not me? Lord, we're so thankful this evening that we could come together in your word, that we could spend time digging into the things of you and coming to a better understanding of what the gifts of the Spirit are and how they operate. But Father, I would be remiss if I didn't close this service tonight asking that you would pour out upon us these same gifts of the Spirit. Your Word says you give them as you will. And we are asking, Lord, we're asking right now in faith that your will would be to distribute those gifts among the people of your church. That in our day, in our time, we can see healings and miracles and signs and wonders and witness prophecy and tongues and interpretation and every gift of the Spirit, Lord. Not just in my brother and not just in my sister, but use me. Use me, Lord, in every gift, in every operation of the Holy Ghost. I want to be a vessel for you, a conduit for your will, a tool for your use and your purpose, God. Let your spirit and your gifts flow through each and every one of us as you will, Father. We thank you for your spirit that I feel here in this empty sanctuary. And I pray that it would go forward from this place into every home and car and bedroom and bathtub where somebody's watching on their cell phone. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for joining us on our live stream tonight. I would that you would remember your prayer time and that if you have not yet selected one, that you would go to the private group and do so. And let us pray together for our city our state, our county, our country, for the leadership of our nation, that the Lord would bring a swift end to COVID-19 and that he would continue to guide us as we ride through this time. Thank you for your attendance. Have a wonderful evening.